Welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship. Um, my, my dad was a Church of England vicar. That is, he's retired. It's not that he's died. Um, but he was a Church of England vicar, and obviously they follow the Book of Common Prayer. And they always start with a sentence from Scripture, and the one that he used most often um, is the verse from First John, uh, where it says, uh, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us from all unrighteousness. Um, and it's a wonderful verse, a wonderful statement of God's love for us. Um, and it's good to remember uh, that we come to worship the king of the universe, but also the father who loves us. Um, so let's begin our worship by singing uh, out the splendor of the king. And we'll stand to sing. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, how great you are. How worthy you are of, of all our praise, of all our worship, of all our lives. How wonderful it is to sing together of how wonderful you are and, and to remember how great you have been in our lives, how much you have done for us. Lord, at times it can leave us speechless. At times it can move us to shout with joy. At times it can move us to tears. How great you are. And Lord, we know that at times we have ignored you. We haven't acknowledged your greatness. We've wandered on our own paths. We've believed in our own greatness more than we believed in yours. We have trusted in our own abilities and skills more than we have trusted in your faithfulness. We have 
done and said and thought things that were not worthy of you. But Lord, we rest on that promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us from all our unrighteousness because all our unrighteousness has been placed upon Jesus who lived and died and rose again that we might come today and stand in your presence unashamed clothed in his righteousness how great is our God that we can come now and sing that we can join together in our worship we can bring you our prayers our every worry and concern no matter how big or how small we can bring them to you now How great is our God. And so we join together in that great prayer that you taught your disciples that acknowledges our wonderful God and our loving Father. And so we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, I don't know about uh, what tea time is like in your house. I don't even know what time you have tea or if you call it dinner. Um, but certainly for me, one of the joys of that early evening uh, is, is getting to watch some quizzes on TV. Uh, a bit of pointless. Got any, are there any pointless fans in the house? Yeah, okay. And then, if you're really lucky, you can follow that up with an extra half hour of Richard Osman on BBC Two in Richard Osman's House of Games. Any House of Games fans in the house? Oh, well, what a good, oh, some, from, some behind me, excellent. Um, so. Uh, Big fan of, of Richard Osman's House of Games, and so we're going to play a round from Richard Osman's House of Games. Um, and uh, there we go, we've even got the logos. I did, I did think about whether or not I could take the time to do an outline of my face, um, but I, uh, I, did, I thought, no, that's going to take too long. I'm not that skilled with Photoshop. Um, but we're going to play a round that some of you, if you watch House of Games, will be familiar with. It's called This Round is in Code. Um, and so I'm going to show you a coded message, um, and the code is very, very simple. Uh, I have replaced the letter A with the number one, the letter B with the number two, and so on all the way up to Z, which is 26. And hopefully, if I've done it right, we will find some things. And in this particular round, we're going to be looking for books of the Bible. Um, just to make it easy on those of you uh, who know your books of the Bible. Um, and they're going to be, they're going to be six. Um, so we'll bring up the first one. And if you wave at me when you think you've got it. So we'll have the first one up. Hopefully. There we go. So we all start doing our numbers and start counting. Oh, we got, my kids do this too much. So they, they've already got it. Anybody else? Are we getting there? Anybody want to shout out at me? I think we'll have to shout. Is it Genesis? Uh, yes, it is. Well done. Genesis is there. Okay, second one. We'll go on to the next one. Is this uh, easier or harder? This might be easier. Is it easier? So what did someone say there? Somebody said Luke. It is, in fact, Luke. Well done. Okay. Well, maybe we'll go, we'll go a little bit longer, shall we? Yeah, okay. Well, what's this one then? I love watching people count letters on their fingers. It's great. Thank you, somebody said it there. Are we all there? Maybe. We've got a few votes for Psalms. Is it Psalms? It is. Well done. It's one of the tricky ones because it's only got one vowel in it, which is annoying. Um, okay, this is a long one. Oh, this is going to be tricky. <laughs> uh, 
Anyone there? I think Jamie's got it already. Revelation. Yes, well done. Well done. It is Revelation. Good job. Okay, we've got, we've got two more. So what's the next one? Oh, now. Uh, tricky again. We all know what the first one is. Which one is it? Is it Zechariah? No, it's not. It's the other one. <laughs> it's Zephaniah. Yes. Just to, just to fool you. And we'll finish with a short one. Someone said it. Titus. Yes. So you should be expecting that one because we're studying Titus at the moment. But it's tricky when you've got all those numbers up and you're kind of going, but they're like, it's like uh, 20 and 21 and, and 19 and they're all in there in the same thing. And you're kind of like, oh my goodness, what's, and it's, you know, all the vowels are mixed up. So, uh, so yeah, well done, Titus. Um, and all this to say is that some people think that uh, the Bible is written in a really hard code that we can't really understand. Um, and, and there are bits of the Bible that are quite difficult to understand, but luckily it's not all written in numbers. Um, now, if you went and looked at some of the original languages and had to learn some, uh, some Hebrew or some Greek, you would be dealing with different alphabets, which makes life a bit complicated. But luckily we have translations uh, in, in our own language to make it a bit easier to understand. Um, but actually, it's not really a, a difficult code, but there are sometimes bits that are difficult to understand. But the secret of reading the Bible, and we've talked about this uh, on different occasions in the past, is that actually throughout the Bible, it's pointing us towards Jesus. And that actually, even in the Old Testament, uh, before Jesus was born, what we see is lots and lots of prophecies which are telling us about this person who's going to come called the Messiah, which we believe is Jesus. And depending on who you talk to, will depend on how many prophecies you think there might be. Uh, if you go online and you do a search for how many prophecies talk about Jesus or something like that in Google, and what you'll get is a number that ranges from somewhere between in the 40s to almost 300. So it's probably somewhere in the middle. That's, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to tell at times, but actually the Old Testament is constantly talking about the Messiah, so it's talking about, we believe, it, Jesus, and there are all these things that the Old Testament says about Jesus that remind us about who he is, and just to make life even easier for us. Uh, what we're told is that when we become Christians, that God gives us the Holy Spirit, and one of his jobs is to help us to understand what the Bible says. So it's like, not only is it not a difficult code because it's all really about Jesus, but actually we also have like a helper, like a Google Translate living inside us, which is the Holy Spirit who kind of helps us as we read the Bible. So this round is in code, but hopefully we can work it out. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he can, uh, he, he is pointed to throughout the Bible and can help us to understand what the Bible is talking about in some of those difficult places and in some of the Old Testament when it's complicated or when it's prophecies of things that are going to happen. So often what we find is Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, um, our, our teacher who comes and lives within us and opens our eyes to what you are saying in your word. I pray now that your Holy Spirit would come here, come to us now and help us as we learn about Jesus. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing a song um, that, that is actually all about all the different places and all the different things that point to Jesus. It's called By Faith. So we'll stand and sing.
So we'll stand and sing uh, 10,000 Reasons.
So Noel mentioned that I would talk about COP26 later, uh, now is later. Um, so I um, just want to say a few words about what's, what's happening for those who don't know and what, what our involvement is likely, hopefully, to be. So COP26 is in a month, four weeks um, to go, which is a bit scary for many, many people I know who are organising different things. Um, and there's still so much that is not known. What is known is that thousands of people are coming to Glasgow for this event. It's a two-week event. Officially, it runs from uh, the 1st to the 14th of November, 13th of November. Lots of stuff happening the opening weekend on the 30th of October, um, and big things happening in the middle weekend. There is going to be just practically lots of disruption um, they're closing the Clydeside Expressway on the 23rd of October, so a week in advance, until the 14th of November, the Monday at the end. Um, so if you, if you drive anywhere in Glasgow and use the expressway, know that it's going to be somewhat chaotic. They are also going to be closing much of uh, our parish uh, from up Finiston Street and then basically everything south of the church will be completely restricted to people who have UN security passes, um, which is still a lot of people. There's a protest march planned on the 6th of November. They're gonna meet in Kelvin Grove Park. They're expecting more than 100,000 people to come. That's 100,000 people. Um, so no one really knows exactly what it's going to be like. There's never been an event like this in Glasgow before, in, in fact, in the UK of this scale. Um, and nobody really knows actually where things are happening. There's a zone on the north side of the river, which is the high security zone. On the south side of the river by the science center is what's called the green zone, where a lot of different organizations will be uh, sort of having exhibition, uh, exhibiting stuff. Um, so there's probably gonna be loads of people there. The city centre is likely to be busy um, as well. So it's confusing and disruptive and big, but it is a huge opportunity for world leaders to make significant changes for the benefit of creation and for the millions of people who've already been adversely affected by climate change, particularly in the poorest regions of the world. Um, even just this morning, the, the leaders are already meeting. Um, if you've ever seen any of the posters, it will say in conjunction with Italy. Uh, BBC News ran a story this morning um, with the headline, Climate Change Stop Smoke and Mirrors Rich Nations Told. They're meeting in Milan. There's, I think, 50 countries, 50 ministers from a range of countries at the moment. Um, and it says in the article, for, extremely vulnerable, uh, for countries extremely vulnerable to changing climate, the priority is more ambitious carbon reductions from the rich nations to preserve the 1.5 centigrade temperature target set by the 2015 Paris Agreement, um, rising above 1.5 degrees is a significant problem and will be a catastrophe of worldwide impact. It is a massive thing and you will see it in the news pretty much every day for the next month. But there's also a lot of Christian involvement, lots going on around Glasgow. Tear Fund, who obviously spend a lot of time working in some of the poorest nations, which are often the ones that are most badly hit by these changes. They're going to be uh, in Glasgow, they're based out of St George's Tron. Um, street pastors, there's thousands of people coming to Glasgow and many of them don't yet have anywhere to stay. Um, I was chatting with friends last night, they know someone in, uh, who lives in Deniston who's moved out of her flat because she's managed to rent it for three weeks in November for seven and a half thousand pounds. 
students all across Glasgow struggling to find accommodation to come to Glasgow University because people know they can rent their flat for a much higher price of people coming to COP. Hotels across the whole of the central belt have been booked out for months. And so actually street pastors, there's, there's going to be people who are sleeping on the streets because they feel so passionately about climate change. They are coming to Glasgow to protest, to make a noise, to be seen, but have nowhere to stay. So street pastors are going to be working hard. 24-7 uh, prayer movement. Again, prayer is such a big thing because we really need some of these changes to happen. Um, and it's significant. And whenever there is a big gathering of people for any kind of event or conference or sports event, often there is so much evil that can come as well. So we need to pray. Um, Sandford are going to be partnering with YWAM. They've got teams of young people coming, I think mostly from the UK, but they're coming across the two weeks. They're coming to do intercession and they're coming to do outreach. But most of all, they're coming actually to be uh, effectively an extension of our congregation. They're coming to be part of Sandiford. Um, they're going to be uh, um, having worship here each morning, which everyone is welcome to come to, come and hear what's going on, hear some testimony of what they're able to do on the streets. And they're going to be going out, going out to pray, going out to uh, actually speak the gospel to people in amongst all of this. Um, so many people coming who know nothing of uh, God and nothing of Jesus and so it's a great opportunity and we will have the opportunity to be involved in that work. Um, we're hoping to run a training session with them later this month so we get a bit of an idea of um, what they normally do. There are lots of logistics still to be worked out. We're doing our best to make sure that everyone stays safe which is not just about being safe on the streets, it's even not just about being safe from COVID but also it's all the things that we often don't think about, like unattended bags and the potential for a massive terror event when you have so many people from so many different nations and we are right on the edge of the most secure part of Glasgow. So all of these logistically, logistic things need to be quite tight and we are working on them now. But I truly believe this is a really important thing for us to be involved in. Um, and I'm really excited to have an organization like YWAM to work with have, boosting our congregation by 50 to 100 young people. What a great opportunity that is uh, for us. Um, and so have a, have a think about whether or not you could be part of this across those two weeks. There'll be opportunity to uh, kind of sign up and be here and be part of the teams for however much time you're able to offer. Um, the other organization that we are working with is Christian Aid. Um, they are going to put a banner outside the church um, Harry has been working hard with them to d sort this out um, because it's 10 meters by 5 meters. Um, so if you, if you look that way and see the pillars either side of that window and imagine it stretches all the way across those pillars and it goes all the way up to the window, um, it's a little bit bigger than that. Um, so that's going to be on the outside of the church. Um, which is a great, again, an opportunity for people to see that, that we're doing something um, and to think about not just climate change, but God. Um, and also their staff are going to be using some of our rooms uh, as a kind of office space, and so they'll be around as well. Above all else, if you're sitting there thinking, you know, I live too far away, I'm not sure I'll be able to get parked, who knows, um, or actually I'm just not free or I'm working hard, we need to pray, uh, there's going to be daily prayer points during the two weeks coming out from various prayer partners. Um, and also over these next three weeks, we're going to continue to pray, uh, pray for our involvement, pray for the wider conference. Um, it's so important that we get on our knees before God because actually the kind of changes that are needed are actually miraculous. And, and there is only one who is in the business of miracles. There'll be more information as we go over the next couple of weeks, but I just wanted to kind of, again, to say, here we are. Let's, let's get involved as much as we can, as much as you're able. We'll give you as many opportunities as we can. And I'm really excited about the possibilities, but I also believe that it's very important what we are doing. Um, so let's take time now and we will 
not pray just for COP, but we will, um, we will pray now and, and bring our prayers to God. So let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can bring you the biggest and the smallest things, the huge issue of climate change and, and uh, uh, the small issue of finances or grades or um, uh, anything like that. And nothing is too small for you and nothing is too big for you. We do pray, Lord, for those who are affected the most by climate change in our world. We pray for those who have lost their homes already, for those who have had their habitat devastated, who felt the destructive power of the increasingly extreme weather conditions. We pray for homes for the homeless. We pray for restoration of things that have been destroyed. We pray that they would find hope in situations that seem increasingly hopeless. You know, we think of those for whom actually they can't even think about the environment because of war and oppression. That, that those are the things that are in front of their faces every day. We pray for peace and freedom. Lord, we pray for those who live in such poverty and that makes them the most susceptible to disruption from all sides. We pray for refugees fleeing from war or from oppression. Think of those who are climate refugees, whose countries are ruined by rising water levels, changes in seasonal weather. We pray for asylum seekers in our nation. We pray for those who have been trafficked. Lord, bring them comfort and safety, freedom and love. Bring them voices who will speak for them, ears who will listen to them, and people who have a heart for the least in our world. We pray for world leaders as they prepare to come to Glasgow. Pray that they would stand firm in their commitments and that they would be committed not just to their own nations, but to the benefit of the whole world. That this would not just be an opportunity to make sure that their countries are safe and forget the rest, but they would recognize that we are all connected by your world and we pray against anyone who would see this as an opportunity to do harm that you would thwart the plans of the enemy pray for those who are coming to glasgow on, on pilgrimages or coming to protest we pray for their safety as they travel and as they are here we pray for shelter for the many who are struggling to find somewhere to stay we pray for safety against COVID and the danger of outbreaks. And Lord, we pray for YWAM and Christian Aid. We thank you for their willingness to be part of what we are doing here in Sandiford. They would encourage us and enthuse us and, and give us a zeal for prayer and for mission. And we pray that your name would be lifted high that this would not just be about environment and climate, but about creation and our stewardship of it. That this wouldn't just be about selfish concerns or even humanitarian altruism, but about honoring our creator and the world he created and the people he loves. And we pray, Lord, that, that you would come and be a source of hope when so much seems hopeless. And that as we engage with people thinking about the world, that we would always be able to point back to you 
as the reason for the hope within us. And bring all our prayers to you now, Lord Jesus, for there is none like you and there is no one else who can answer our prayers as you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, sing, sing again. Uh, speak, O Lord. a second to sit down. I've been working hard this morning. So we're turning again to Titus. Having spent three weeks in Titus 1, we're now going to do Titus 2 in a week, um, just to keep you guessing. Uh, and just by way of introduction, uh, Titus, we know, is being sent to Crete to bring order uh, to the church, and has been told to establish elders in, of good character in each town, and they need to come and combat the, the false teaching, um, particularly the pull coming from those who would have Christians submit to Jewish rituals. 
Um, so that's where we're at, and he's been told to do that in chapter 1. Um, so we're going to read from chapter 2. Um, Titus, it's kind of near the end. Uh, it's in the second half of your Bibles in the New Testament. Um, and certainly in my Bible, it's like two pages long, so it's kind of hard to find. Um, so I, which is why I, ha- why I have a bookmark, because otherwise I'd stand here fiddling through pages for ages. Um, but yeah. Let's read from Titus and chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. I'm going to read down to the end of the chapter of verse 15. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Amen. So we get to the, what, what should you teach and how should you encourage these elders to teach? How do you go about it? How do, you, how do they rebuke those who are teaching falsely? But more importantly, what should they teach? What positive contribution should they make? Uh, and he says, kind of straight out, you should teach sound doctrine. Now, the word doctrine is actually just another word for teaching. Um, it, we see it a lot in our own, uh, our own language. Uh, we talk about doctorates, doctors, all of these things. Uh, it's all to do with teaching. And so actually what he's saying is, if you want to combat false teaching, you do some good teaching. Um, so actually it's not as complicated as it might sound. Doctrine is one of these words that's got a bit of a bad reputation, but it's just another word for teaching. And so he says, you know, actually what you need to do is you can't just go in and and tell them that what they're saying is false. You need to actually replace it with with sound or healthy teaching. And not only that, the the belief is here that actually sound teaching will lead to sound behavior. And there's a link here and you say, you know, actually these false teachers, what's happened is that they have taught falsely, They've been going after their own gain, and the result is that the the church is behaving falsely in an unhealthy manner, and therefore bring in sound teaching, and that will lead to sound behavior. And all of that, as we'll see when we get down a little bit further in the passage, all of this is rooted in the transformative power of the gospel. It's not just about if you teach the right things and they do the right things, then everything will be happy. He says, all of this is rooted actually in the good news and actually it's the good news that changes people is the gospel that changes people ultimately and so he goes on and he says um you know you need to teach the uh, teach the older men to do this and teach the older women to do that now just by way of um catch, cashing in on exciting code um and uh, and also uh, my my Uh, my education from the church. Um, There's some Greek going on here, um, which I'm going to put on the screen. Um, We've used three words that are very, very similar in the last couple of weeks. Today we have older men, which is actually the word presbutas, 
And then older women, presbuteras, and then presbuteros we used a couple of weeks ago, um, and it's translated usually as elder, it's a plural word. Um, and so what we're seeing is uh, some of the complications here of how we translate some of these things. Um, and uh, it's difficult because often we read some of these things and we kind of go, actually, what it's talking about here is, is, is older people. And therefore, all of you who consider yourself to be younger people can nod off. Um, but that, that, I don't think, is what it's saying. Um, it's also not saying, because uh, not saying that actually if you want to be an elder in the church, you need to be old. Actually, Paul says exactly the opposite in Timothy. He says, don't let people despise you because of your youth. So just because you get older doesn't mean you have to become an elder. Just because you are younger doesn't mean you don't get to be an elder. There are complexities in translating, and, it, and it's tricky. The word elder is used quite often um, in, in the context of first century to, to denote leadership. And so quite often when, when we talk about uh, the, the church leaders, what you will find is the word presbyteros, the elders of the Jewish people. Um, and again, within the church, the elders of the church. Um, but it's not necessarily a sense of, of age. But at the same time here, um, we are, there's a recognition, if there are older people, then as a consequence, there must also be younger people. Otherwise, he wouldn't differentiate. And so there's a sense here of a multi-generational church of a church that spans different generations. And, and the encouragement then is to pass on our faith to others by our example and by our teaching. Older men need to be temperate. Older women shouldn't be addicted to too much wine. It's basically the same thing. They're worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and, and endurance. The older women need to be reverent, not be slanderers, not addicted to wine, to, but to teach what is good. And then, and then not just to do that within the context of themselves, but, verse 4, to urge the young women in the way that they live, so that no one will malign the word of God. The end of verse 5. Um, so what's a, the picture here is of a church where there is a spread of difference, and that might be physical age, but it could also be actually maturity in their faith, and this sense that we are all involved with each other. And actually, one of the great sadnesses of the church in our world is how it's increasingly become quite homogenized. Some churches are filled to the gunnels with young people. Some churches are just full of old people. Some churches specialize in one culture or another. Some don't even know they're doing it. I think it's really sad because the picture in Scripture of, of the church, capital C, the church worldwide, is this sense that we're all in this together and that we're all different and we all come from different places and we're all different ages, but that we come together as the body of Christ and we all bring something different and we all have something to bring that is us. We all have a part to play in what is the church. You know, and we may have limitations. We may have limitations in our physicality. But I tell you what, age is not a limitation. Whether you consider yourself too young or too old, the number on your birth certificate is meaningless in the church. Now you may say, ah, oh, but, I have physical limitations, yes. I'm partially deaf. There are certain things that I struggle to do because of that. I have slightly dodgy knees from playing too much football as a young boy, and sometimes they ache. 
But actually, it doesn't limit me all that much. But some of you have got increasingly, and some of, you, and some of your limitations are due to the fact that you're getting older. But age is not a limitation. You shouldn't say, just because I am this number, I cannot do this thing. You might physically be unable to do it, that's different. But there is no point in scripture where it says, do you know what, now that you have reached the grand old age of X, you suddenly get to stop and sit back and go, I am done my bit now. You get to keep going. And it may be that what you do is pray, and that's all you can do. Or it may be that there are other things that you, you can and cannot do. That's fine. But we all have a part to play. And we have a part to play in each other's lives. This is the very core of what it is to be disciples. The very mission of the church, to make disciples, is all about this being together. It's about living your life of faith with other people. That's how discipleship happens. It's not a course that you take over 10 weeks or six weeks, or in the case of the, of the early church, three years before you, could, before you could get baptized into the church. It doesn't matter how long or short the course is, that's not what discipleship is. Discipleship is a lifelong endeavor, and it's one that we do together. There's an author called Mike Breen, who writes a lot about leadership and discipleship, and he says, look, we all look like sheep from behind, uh, like sheep from the front and like shepherds from behind. That is, the people following us think we're the shepherd and the people who look back at us think we're the sheep. That we're all part of this. And it's, it's not about having all the answers. We talked about that last week. It's not saying, actually, now I have sorted all of the answers of the Christian life. Now I can disciple people because I've got it right. Because none of us have. It's about saying, do you know what? I have found an answer and it, about one thing. And there's someone else over there who I think actually doesn't know that. Maybe I'll tell them. Maybe I found this thing that revolutionized my prayer life. It's the... TSP, thank you, sorry, please. I've just discovered that. That's great. I'm going to go to someone else and say, do you know, I've just found this new way to pray, where you go, thank you, sorry, please, and you pray all those things. It could be as simple as that, or the most complicated thing. The key to it is not knowing it. The key to it is passing it on. And that's the key to discipleship, as I think is being pulled out here, is to say, actually, we all have a responsibility, whether we are young men, old men, young women, old women, we have a responsibility to each other to be disciples with each other. And how does it look and what does it mean? End of verse 7. Sorry, end of verse 8. Sound of speech, you can't be condemned. So that, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing to say about us. It's possibly the most challenging verse, certainly in today's reading, possibly that I'll read in a long time. We must live lives and speak so well so that anyone who would say, actually, those Christians are no good, would look at us and go, do you know what? I'm ashamed to have thought that because look at these people. I have nothing to say about them. Now, that's not how the church plays out in our society at the moment. There is plenty that those outside the church can look in and say, well, you know, look what's happening in the church. And that's a sadness. But our calling is to live lives to those outside the church, even though they oppose us, would actually be ashamed of themselves. Because when they actually look at the church, they go, do you know what? I can find nothing wrong there. What a challenge that is. So we have this call to discipleship, and he goes on, verses 9 and 10, he goes back into uh, the uh, slavery. I talked about slavery um, on the 22nd of August, 
um, and just some of the differences um, in what, how we often think of slavery, modern day chattel slavery. Um, so I have talked about that before, I'm not going to go into great detail this morning. Um, just to say that this is not an endorsement of slavery, this is an encouragement to live a holy and blameless life regardless of the situations that we are in. He's not trying to change the world in, in this book as, as such, although disciples of Jesus will and do change the world. What he's saying is, how do you live a, as a disciple in your current situation? Even if in, in something like slavery as it was then. But as I say, if you want to go back and uh, listen to the 22nd of August, then there's more there. So, live as disciples. Why? For, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Why do we do this? We do this because of the gospel, the good news. We live as disciples of Jesus because we believe in the good news that actually he came and died and rose for us so that, so that we could live with him for eternity and we could live in this world to share his glory with others. So why do we live this blameless life? We live it for the sake of the gospel. But how on earth can we manage it? We can manage it because of the gospel. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who, that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That eagerness is something that God gives us. That's the, the most wonderful thing about the gospel, is not God has done this great thing for us, um, and, if, and if we want it, we have to work hard to live wonderfully holy lives that is actually really hard. Good news of the gospel is that God has done that for us, and in order for us to live that life, he comes and does it in us. He comes and works in us. He pours his spirit in us so that we can say no to ungodliness, because actually in ourselves we can't. Actually in ourselves, even if we try really hard, even if we manage it for 23 and a half hours out of 24 every day, there's going to be a half hour when we struggle and we say yes to ungodliness. We say yes to worldly passions and we fail to live that self-controlled life. That's, that's what happens if we try in ourselves. He says, actually, how can we do this? We can do this because God, through Jesus, comes and lives in us. And he enables the kind of life that he talks about in this passage, the kind of discipleship life. The life that is worthy of respect, the life that is blameless. And it won't happen overnight. And it is a process. And it is a struggle. And we do have to work at it. But ultimately, it comes from a transformation of who we are when we accept Jesus. So we need to live a life of faith together. That's what being a disciple and being a church is. And we do that so that the gospel can be proclaimed in our lives. And we do it and we can do it because of the impact that Jesus has on our lives. In all of this, we need more of him. Because without him, it is an impossible standard. But with him, the impossible is made possible. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, none of us want to be bad people. We all want to live 
good lives. But it is not in our power to do that. It is you in us that makes that a possibility. And so, Lord, we pray for more of you. We confess our sin, knowing that it will be forgiven. And we ask for more of your spirit, that we would be able to say no to ungodliness. We thank you for the power of the gospel in our lives. We thank you for the life that Jesus led, for the death he died for our sake and in our place, and for his resurrection, that we too might lose ourselves and gain a new life in us, and that that new heart beating in us would enable us to lead lives that are so different, and that we would share those lives with others, with those who are older than us and those who are younger than us. That we would speak your words each day of our lives to those around us as we live as disciples, as we live the life of faith together. Help us to look beyond the things we cannot do and say, Lord, what can I do? Help us to look beyond the limitations of our minds and our bodies and experience the unlimited power of your spirit in our lives as we open ourselves and say, Lord, what can I do for you? Come, Lord Jesus, open our eyes, expand our vision, help us to lead each other and disciple each other so that we would be ordinary people who believe in an extraordinary God. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn today is uh, the good old hymn, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. So now go into the world and live lives of faith, love, and endurance. Be examples to those around you. Learn from your elders. Teach your youngers.
Share your life of faith with all who would know you for the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.